Hello and welcome. Tonight we're speaking about the nature of religious experience. With me is Jacob Needleman. Professor Needleman is a professor of philosophy at the San Francisco State University and an author of numerous books, including Why Can't We Be Good? and What is God? Professor Needleman, thank you for coming. I'm delighted to be here. Very happy to have you here. Good. Your, your book, What is God? It's been described as your most personal book. It started with a story of you sitting, looking at the stars with your father. Um, you want to talk about that experience a bit? Well, yes, I was eight years old, and I didn't know the words religious experience at all. Um, I knew there was something called religion vaguely, and, but uh, my father is a very quiet, per, a private person, a somewhat stern. And this particular evening, it was a summer night, it was very hot. Uh, he would outside, we lived in this small duplex apartment. Uh, and he had this victory garden, which was a garden that the citizens kept during World War II to help the food supply and so forth. And he was sitting out on the stone steps. It was late at night for us. And uh, I went down stairs. I thought I would take a walk into the park where it was beautiful nature. But I saw him sitting on the steps in front of our door, front door. And I sat down next to him. We were both very quiet. And he was looking up <clears throat> at the stars which he often did. And I was very quiet sitting next to him. I didn't know why he was quite so silent this time. and I didn't want to disturb him. Uh, suddenly I looked up at the stars with him. And for some reason, suddenly the sky just filled with stars. I. I I didn't, I was very young, I didn't know about that things like that were not supposed to happen, but suddenly there were like millions of stars up there instead of the usual, you know, it was a lot of stars. It was dark summer night, we were in the suburbs, but you know, in a city suburb, there's always some uh, kind of vapor in the air that prevents, so you see a few stars. But suddenly I was looking up at millions, seemed to be millions of stars with hardly any spaces in between them. And I was just blown away. And I was just there, sitting there looking at these stars. And out of nowhere, he simply said, that's God. That's God. What? As though he was sharing my experience in some way. But that sense of wonder, of awe that I often had was really exceptionally strong that evening when I was looking up at the stars. And that was a kind of, if that wasn't, a, that was a spiritual experience. Had nothing to do with religion that I knew of, or institutional religion, or words of uh, belief systems, philosophical ideas. It was just myself, very small, part of something very big. Mm -hmm. So I was both big and small at the same time. Something inside you opened up. Yes, but this thing um, of being big, big and small, and small at, the and same small time, at the same time, that is, became a kind of criterion of what a spiritual, or spiritual experience now may be the best thing to call it. What kind of experience is one of the keys of real spirituality and therefore of deep religion? I had that feeling when I brought my son home from the hospital. Oh. Yeah, big and small at the same time. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, I felt connected to all of the life because I had this little person with me, and yet everything that was important to me was right in front of me. That's good. So we really, that it, it, it sort of d defines the real nature of a human being, that we are big and small at the same yes. time. We're connected, something in us is a part of something very, very big and great and higher than ourselves. And yes. something in us is small and busy and active and, and my own little individuality, which is precious, but there's this big selfhood which we're part of. So there's a duality there, and you talk about duality a bit in the book. 
Yes, there's just a, and people don't like duality these days. They think it's all one. Well, it is one, but it's not all the same. It's uh, the oneness that is the real oneness includes many things. And I think this is the, in order to have the real oneness, the, you have to have the real two-ness, the real duality. And the, the, the wrong duality divides things where they shouldn't be divided. But the right duality divides them at the joint. And the joint between heaven and earth is human consciousness, between the greater and the smaller. So I think that is a precious duality, not, a, not something to be resisted, but to be understood. What sort of duality would be the wrong duality? Would that well, be the ego well, and the... No, the, 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 the uh, separation of man from nature, the way yeah. you, you put it, the separation of my uh, consciousness from the universal world that's around me, uh, the, the separation of races and racial types of, of uh, human classes, classes, the, the distinctions that really are very superficial. On one level, yes, there are differences, but underneath we're all human beings, and underneath we're all part of great nature, and nature has many levels, many levels of mind, intelligence, purpose, and so the, 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 to separate, to alienate and one part of oneself that understands and explains like scientifically the world and acts in the world, creates things, does things. That part of myself, I don't know if you want to call it the ego, I, not necessarily, but to separate that from the part that feels and hopes and loves and has compassion and, and a sense of wonder, that's a false duality. They're different, but to, to make it cut and that one does not relate to the other, that one is different than the other or even ignorant of the other, that is, I would say, the wrong duality. Do you feel that science does that to some extent when they push out the organic and push out the, the observer? Um, no, they do it for a reason that's a good reason. They want, they want to be impartial and they want to be objective. So science itself is not the wrong dualism, but which what has been called scientism is a wrong dualism, which is a, a, a separation of spiritual instinct, a separation of human need of love from knowledge. When you separate mental knowledge from organic love and compassion and, and awe and feeling and responsibility and morality. When you separate those two off without any real interrelationship between them, they're meant to be harmoniously interconnected. When you make that separation, you build a wall between knowledge and one's, you might call one's whole being, one's inner being then that's a false separation. So the real problem of duality comes within the self, and that results in a view of nature and the world, which is compartmentalized without any relation to each other. Something like that, I think. I think it's a, it's a good question to ponder, really, because yes. we don't want to say everything is mushy, just one, but we also want to say that things are just not related to each other inside of ourselves as well as outside. That makes sense? It makes perfect <laughs> sense. I'm wondering, um, I think sometimes about the nature of large organizations and how we have to lose our individual individuality when we sort of plug into them. The difference between, say, the collective and the communal, the difference between um, Large organizations where you might lose your individuality a bit uh, in relating to them, and it could be uh, the Catholic Church, it could be a university, it could be you know any large organization. It seems um, uh, imposes 
perhaps the wrong kind of duality. That's interesting, the way you put it. Uh, to lose yourself in an organization, in a collectivity, as opposed to a community right. where you find yourself. That's right. As, as opposed to a, a something that's uh, um, a reflection of a, a lot of individuals expressing themselves. Um, there's anthropologists that talk about the make a distinction between the collective and the communal. Stanley Diamond, in particular, mm -hmm. he would he might talk about how uh, he'd be looking at a um, a large tribal dance in West Africa, and and noting how. Everyone is, is, has their own movements and very individualistic, but yet they're still part of a, a greater whole. Uh, and and the, just the, the opportunities for true individuation within an indigenous society, as opposed to the way that we have to continually um, set aside our indiv individuality that's, that's to, to be part of a larger collective. It, it, in some ways, it's a separate question from the, the, the main topic of tonight, which no, is... it's you know, not a separate question. All right. Not at all. I okay, think it's very it. much so. All right, good. It, in its own way, we're talking about the large and the small here. That's right. That mankind That's right. is the biggest. But any, a community, a community, is the large selfhood, the large identity, the large big self, and the small self is myself. And, uh, but I am also not just part of that, I'm all of that in a, in a way, as well as that's right. myself. That's so I right. That's right. It's exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about. But we lose that. What? We lose that. We lose it. Yes. We lose it with with large organizations where, if they get too large, um, you it seems like uh, you necessarily lose that individuality, and you lose that feeling of wholeness, and you lose that holographic feeling of being part of, part of truly part of something larger. Yeah, um, you can, but I'm not so, I, <clears throat> I wonder how much it's a question of size and a question of human attitudes. Ah. Uh, because you, I can imagine a very large communion, maybe not, I think it's a question, but I could imagine a large community, uh, a large state, a, star, a large nation, a country, which has a, a, a spiritual organization at the background and penetrating through it so that one, so I think you could be lost in a small group as well as in a big corporation. But you take a, an ancient society, I don't know much about these things, but like what ancient Egypt or what the, uh, Tibet used to be in, in principle was a large community, a nation of people organized by great spiritual values. And so, there, it, it, it's uh, not just a matter of size, but a matter of the values, the worldview, the principles of life that per penetrate the whole, the whole community, the whole nation, the whole country. And that brings people, can bring people together, even though there's different parts doing different things. Don't you think it's, it's that? You know? I wonder, I wonder how, how it can be done in a nation if it's possible for a I nation to, to, you know, to, to have that to. sort of a spiritual underpinning. Well, I, I wish it were so, and I, I hope it is so, but well, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I wonder if it's so, but I think it, it can be possible. Let's call it a culture, not maybe not a nation. The nation's a very modern idea in a way, but a culture, uh, I mean, <clears throat> even at its worst, I would think medieval Christianity the Christianity of a certain period of the medieval world was kind of permeated by a worldview of values which may have made help people feel relationship even from the higher power possessing people to the lower. I can imagine it's possible. We certainly don't have it now. We are really desperately in need of values that connect people and practices that connect people at their, at their deepest level. I agree that it's very hard to imagine. America as an ideal could have been a little step toward that at its conception, as the founders conceived of it. It could have been the, with the idea of freedom, of liberty, political liberty, enough to be able to come together and search for one's own individual conscience. 
So the conscience of a, of a nation could exist as well as the conscience of the individual, I guess. But people feel the lack of that, I must say. Well, there's so many things pushing in the other direction. All, all, of, the, all of the things that respond to, um, all of the reaction to it is organic and individual, but, but what's pressing down on you seems to be uniform and um, uh, you know, capitalism and uh, you know, all of our institutions and just the abstraction of money and the way that it has uh, really um, insinuated itself into uh, our politics and uh, I agree, our, our, but the, um, um, the fact that we're still at liberty to come together and speak together uh, and search together is still makes this country very precious and not every country has so much liberty, political liberty, to come together and think together, and search together, and that's the most precious thing. I agree there's so much wrong with America now, you couldn't count it, but there's still that possibility. With that, when that, if that's gone, then America's finished. But as long as we still have that, I think something is possible. But then that puts the question back to the real need that what, what is our response as citizens, as it were, to a nation where we are free to speak and work together and search together? Because it's happening here in Berkeley in places, people come together freely. We are coming together. It's not always so easy. That means the art of listening to another human being and opening to each other becomes And thinking principle. together, yeah. as you dwell on in your book. Yes. Thinking together. Thinking yes. together, yeah. yeah. Socrates. That's something you practice in your classroom. Pardon me? You practice it in your classroom. Yes, yeah. I try. And, yes. and you, you write very well about the breakthroughs you have. Oh, that was, yeah, that was, uh, I, uh, yeah, someone once asked me, what is the secret of being a good teacher? And I was surprised to find myself saying, listening. <laughs> you would think I'm so finding the right words, having clear eyes, but, but it's, the basis is listening. And I think it's the, also the basic, basic need of community which we started by talking about. The basic need of human relationship is listening, I think. Letting the other in. It can it's, happen in a classroom, for sure. It does. It happens in a classroom. It can happen in a classroom. The biggest compliment I ever had was from a black woman about four or five years ago, in her middle, middle, middle-aged woman, who came up at the end of my class and said, Professor, you really want us to think for ourselves, don't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> With your whole body. Yeah. Not just your mind, your whole body. Whole body. Well, your whole being. Your whole being. Your whole yes. being. Yes. Joseph Campbell talks about myth as, myths as um, uh, metaphors that originate from organs of the body, uh, one of which is the mind. That's a nice, very yeah. nice way of putting it. But uh, you know, thinking with your whole body, and George Lakoff also talks about how. Oh all, yes, so he does. Yeah, all all cognition is really um, part of the body. The, you know, it's, it's a physical function. Why is that so liberating? Why do you think? Is it liberating? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It does so suddenly it liberates something. I think. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting. But. Um, I'll share with uh, you and our viewers that um, uh, I had an interesting experience uh, lately where um, it was a psychotropic experience. And I was experiencing psychotropics. And uh, the experience was, um, uh, it was a mushroom. And uh, the, the mushroom asked me, why are you here? And I answered with my head and nothing happened. And then I answered with my stomach, and that was the answer. The answer came out of my stomach. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. You have to know which organ, but maybe when you used your head and your stomach together, that was happening too. Perhaps. Because you told totally me the stomach gave you the, the truth, the head made the, had the words. I don't know. The question was inside me and outside me at the same time. The question was, why am I here and why are you here? It was the same question. Um, because my experiences, uh, 
that I was having, the colors and the shapes and what have you. They were inside me and outside me at the same time. Mm. Well, so you had a, a more inclusive consciousness then? Yeah. It was, it was my, it, my first and only experience of that kind. But really? It was, yeah. Well, that we had to get a, a, a key to this wrong duality, which would be to have just the outside experience and not be aware of the inside. Yes. But to have both together, the inside and the outside, somehow it was one person speaking. That's right. And that just, that, that, that that's amazing. something brought those two together. Right. That's the third thing. That yeah. which brings together yeah. the inner and, and I the think outer. that's what we've lost. Yes. I think so that's what indigenous people had yeah. that we have lost. I think you're right. I think you're right. They, have, they, they had begin. a shamanic view of the world. Yeah, absolutely. An animistic view of the world. That's because they really saw with a very special organ of sight. They could see the invisible earth. We see just the visible earth. That's right. Which is what my next book is about. The Invisible Earth. That's the title? The title is An Unknown World, Notes on the Meaning of the Earth. Ah. <laughs> it's a good title. Yes. And you said that the title doesn't come easy, but when it does come easy, sometimes the rest of the book comes easily too. Yeah, when they, when they get the title of the book, the first sentence is the tough one. Right. <laughs> right. Are you a writer? I've tried. Yeah. I've tried, and I have new respect for writers. Yeah. I wanted to write about the nature of abstract thought. That would be useful. Because mm. when, when you said it about the abstractions, that's an en sort of as an enemy, and I think you're right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that too much abstract thought um, is not helpful to any culture. It seems that, um, you know, the indigenous people, and Stanley Diamond talks about this, they, they often didn't, don't need to to think in abstractions. If they, they don't count unless they're counting something, or they don't talk about love, you know, love, unless they are talking about some love of someone for something. Uh, there's no need to, to abstract. Uh, At the same time, it's a very great power to the abstraction. It's very powerful. When you it, know it, it's powerful, it gives you a big boost of ego. That was the nature of my big. thesis as I was writing, is that you can look at the, the major periods of human history um, and you can see major jumps in, in our uh, abstraction. The, the first is the language itself. Um, and uh, the second would be uh, civilization. Uh, the second would be, or the third would be really uh, the whole uh, Greek experience with democracy. Um, uh, the fourth might be um, uh, the Renaissance period. And uh, the fifth, our current period. And in each of those periods, what you find with large jumps in abstraction is uh, increasing power over the environment, increasing uh, ego, um, but also more alienation. And uh, you can find that in each of those periods and dissect that. But I think that that's a pattern that we have. And now it seems that we've, we've really just associated abstraction with intelligence with these SAT tests. No, I think you know, it's been overdone. But it's, it's completely it is, overdone. In its place, abstraction is a very great thing. It can serve something great. It can serve us. It doesn't serve us now. It, it, it rules us. It rules us. And that's Money the is the big one. Money rules us. Money, that's uh, right. Noam Chomsky puts it really well when he says that uh, uh, the manager of a corporation, if he doesn't externalize all his costs, um, He'll be out. Someone else will. He, he has no choice. So uh, you know we ha we have no choice. But the the alienation is, um, well, it it's just on a level that it seems to be getting greater and greater. So you know, speaking of an indigenous society, uh, Stanley Diamond talks in books like uh, In Search of the Primitive about the the level of commitment that individuals had to their society that you know, it would be inconceivable to do the sorts of things that uh, the financial managers uh, in Wall Street do when they say bundle these bad loans and sell them. You know, here are people that we've entrusted to be the operating system of our economy, and they are, they are doing something for personal gain that, that they know is systemically weakening the entire economy. You know, these sorts of things are unthinkable in, in, in indigenous uh, society. Well, 
there's good good points of all of that, and we are kind of a mess. But humanity's always been kind of a mess, hasn't it? I mean, the crimes of indigenous cultures also have to be noted, and the brutality sometimes. We some cultures descend, not every culture ascends, and no no culture, nothing in the world stays put in one place. They're either moving up toward something higher or better or down toward something more violent, more selfish and so forth. So we have to kind of, we, and I'm sure you're not doing this, but we mustn't be overly romantic about the indigenous people, but nor must we be contemptuous of them and think that we're anything better than them. I was thinking of Colin Turnbull, this anthropologist who wrote these the two books, The Mountain People, and the forest people. And the forest people are the pygmies who have a very high degree of what you're talking about, of a deep soul that experiences nature and a community and music and love. And the mountain people, which are called the ick, which are totally degenerate, selfish, egoistic, with all their primitiveness. So it's a point that I think is valuable, among everything else you've said, is that it puts it it raises the question. It really deepens the whole question of who we are, what our culture is, where it's failing, where we need to go. And I think a deepened, a deepened question is really what we need. When we're so in question like that, we can see things more as they are. Does that make sense? It does. So well, we only have I, a couple minutes left. So as I sometimes joke, not so jokingly, we philosophers don't do answers. We do questions, yes. and a, a deep question is much better than a shallow answer. And put that on your sweatshirt. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a, a wonderful sweatshirt. <laughs> I recently joined a, a church, a Native American church, and uh, uh -huh. we, we spend uh, Saturdays, going tomorrow, spending Saturday. And uh, we, uh, we have a healing ceremony, and we spend all day, and sometimes well into the night, uh, with each person, you know, we're taking our time, each person speaking their mind and their heart. And uh, at the end, um, we, it's about 20 of us uh, in each session. And in the end, you really feel that you're, uh, you've created a, a, a something larger. Uh, you're part of a group. And uh, it's a wonderful experience, something that I, that I want to continue. That's wonderful. That's great. Yeah, yeah. So how, do, how can the rest of us do that and still occupy the place that we've been dealt, the, the hand right. we've been dealt. That's right. Well, it's a, it's a question for all of us. Yeah. Well, Professor Needleman, thank you so much for coming. I've really enjoyed talking well, to you. I've enjoyed a, a, converse, a real conversation. Thank you so Very much. Very good. Uh, thank you. And thank you for watching. Good night.